This is the story of one of the biggest robberies in American history. A robbery so big, its impact can still be felt 150 years later. And like most of the biggest robberies in the world, nobody was punished. Picture this. It's 1865. The U.S. Civil War has just ended. The Confederacy is over. And with it, slavery. Formerly enslaved people who fought for the Union during the Civil War had received something for the first time in their lives. A salary. In some places, the military established small banks for these soldiers to deposit their new earnings. And understanding that millions of newly freed people should be integrated into the economic system, Congress decided to expand on that idea and created the Freedmen's Bank. The bank was clearly defined as a savings institution. It would not give out loans, and the deposits would only be invested in relatively safe government-backed securities. It was supposed to help black families earn money on their deposits and increase financial literacy. The bank was initially quite successful, quickly expanding to 37 branches across the country. More than 100,000 people opened accounts. Most deposits were small, less than $60. But the small deposits reflected a bigger hope. This period in US history is called Reconstruction, when black people were promised equality and the chance to build wealth. But none of that happened. A few things about the Freedmen's Bank. First, even though the bank was created by Congress and marketed to black people as a way to safely invest their savings, the deposits were not protected by the government. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures most bank deposits in the US, wouldn't exist for another 70 years. And second, despite being created for black people and hiring black people to work in its branches, the bank had an all-white board of trustees. Third, in 1870, that all-white board convinced Congress to change the bank's charter, allowing it to make riskier investments and give out loans. The bank's customers were not told about this change. The board started investing in risky projects and giving out loans to their friends. Some of the trustees were in charge at other banks, and incredibly, they would make bad loans there and then transfer them to the Freedmen's Bank's books. This was corruption and theft, and in a country still dealing with the economic fallout of a civil war, it was also a disaster. A financial panic in 1873 made many of the board's loans and investments worthless. Panicked customers made runs on several branches, desperate to get their money out. And so, in 1874, Frederick Douglass, yes, the famous abolitionist, was brought on to serve as president of the Freedmen's Bank. He'd always been a strong supporter and put a lot of his own money into the bank. The hope was that his presence would reassure customers. But it didn't take him long to realize the scale of the disaster. The bank shut down a few weeks later. It had lost $3 million, $72 million in today's money. But that number doesn't really capture the full cost of the wealth that this money could have built over generations. Instead, thousands of families, many of whom had recently been enslaved, lost everything. Congress did authorize depositors to get back some of what they were owed, but most were unable to be paid, and others spent years or decades filing claims. Meanwhile, none of the men who ran the bank into the ground ever faced legal action. It was a crushing blow to hopes for black economic prosperity. And just three years later, the federal government pulled its troops out of the South. Reconstruction was over, and the old social hierarchy was back. Over the next 150 years, the broken promises and theft of this period played out over and over again for black Americans. From the return of slave labor in prisons and the profitability of mass incarceration, to Jim Crow laws, segregation, and lynchings. From voter suppression and inequality under the law to the urban policies that created impoverished neighborhoods, the banking rules that denied black people loans, and the housing covenants that kept them out of better homes. From the destruction of Black Wall Street in Oklahoma to the predatory lending schemes that cost millions of people, disproportionately black, their homes and wealth in the 2008 financial crisis. Today, the average white family has seven times the wealth of the average black family. The legacy of the Freedmen's Bank is still alive. Yeah.